Hello, everybody. I am Jason Trost, the host of Business of Betting podcast. I am joined by Varun Sadakar today from BetDex. Um, he's the CEO and founder, I believe. The, are you the founder as well? Yes. CEO and founder of BetDex, um, uh, a blockchain crypto exchange. We're going to get into the weeds about that. Why don't we kick off by telling the founding story of BetDex? Like, what's the mission? Um, I'm quite a skeptic in terms of this space. So, um, what I what I'd like to get into eventually is sort of like you to answer my you know why I'm wrong or why you disagree with what I'm saying. But why don't we kick off by um, the the founding story, what niche you're trying to solve, and uh, what you're looking to do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Bedtex itself, where I, we started a company, we started a little bit over a year ago. Uh, started with myself and my two co-founders. Um, so one was Nigel Eccles, who's the chairman of the company. Nigel was the CEO and uh, one of the co-founders of FanDuel. And then our CTO is Stuart Toner. Stuart is, I uh, was actually the first engineer that we ever had at FanDuel. Um, in my background, I used to work at FanDuel as well where, uh, for a number of years. And that's, that's where we all met and got to know each other. And what the kind of the story and the vision behind BetDex is, uh, we wanted to create a company where it can become the sports betting betting destination for winners, and that's kind of that's the just the one line vision of what we wanted, uh, what we're trying to do. And you know, if you peel back the onion a bit and think about like how did that come about and why did we choose that, I think the time that we had at Fanduel from all of us as uh, you know our experience there, as well as experience from the, some of the early team members, et cetera, and other uh, sport betting uh, destinations uh, or, or companies led us to realize that uh, you know, sports betting is an absolutely massive industry. I think there's a lot of interest there, but it's rife with a number of problems, which I think wouldn't really be acceptable in, in other industries, but for whatever reason in sports betting, they're there, right? So if you think about things like this high fees, difficulty with drawing your money sometimes from offshore books, um, getting stake limited because you're, you know, an ROI positive player, um, having difficulty just getting your bet on, et cetera. So those are the type of problems that we wanted to solve. And that's why we started BetDex. Fantastic. Well, those are definitely problems in the industry. I completely agree with that. So what's the crypto angle? Is that, is that superfluous to, not superfluous, is that uh, separate from your goal of winners? Like if you could solve being a good place for winners to bet and treating customers fairly with fiat currency, would you do it with fiat currency? Or is crypto part of the secret sauce that you think you need to uh, solve that? Yeah, great question. So just to be just to be clear, like so the betting itself that occurs on the platform, it's in it's it's in what we call a stable coin. It's what the crypto term is. So we it occurs in uh, the, the currency we use it's called USDT. So it's equivalent to US dollar. Um, the crypto aspect, you know, to your question is if we were able to create a system where uh, we're able to you know, solve all these problems without crypto, 100% we would do it, right? I think for us, the reason that we chose to build on the blockchain is because it ha allows us to, it provides the rails to make the sports betting uh, market more akin to what the financial markets are like. So let me you know dig into that if you don't mind. So if you think about right now, if you the financial, if you think about like the sports betting markets, it's it's massive, but it's really highly discrete and kind of fragmented liquidity pools, right? So, and that's very different than say the financial markets. And if you think about like the financial markets, where you can I can place uh, in order to buy Tesla from Charles Schwab. You can place an order to take the other side, presumably from Merrill Edge, Market Pro, or something. And these front end you know, companies are just acting as kind of like brokers. And then there's on the back end, it's getting matched across this like pool of liquidity, right? And so that's what we are really trying to do with uh, uh, with sports betting, and that's why we chose to build on the blockchain because it provides us the rails to do so. What rails does blockchain give you that? Fiat doesn't give you. I don't understand that uh, aspect. Yeah. So the so the the betting exchange 
itself. Uh, so BetDex itself, it's a P2P sports betting exchange, and it's built on this blockchain called Solana. The underlying on-chain, which is like the matching algorithm and order book, um, we've actually spun that out into a permissionless protocol. And so what that is, it's called the Monaco protocol. And it's a protocol which anyone can go and choose to go and build upon. And so what BetDex actually uh, is doing right now, BetDex itself is just acting as an interface to allow you to go and place a wager onto the Monaco protocol. And so it's almost like, think about it as, in some ways, it's almost like an open source Betfair, if that makes sense, uh, as to what we're trying to build. Okay, well, let, let, let's dig into this more because, you know, I, I'm technical and built an exchange and I think this stuff's confusing for me and I imagine it might be a little bit confusing for other people. Okay, yeah. so Betdex is a centralized exchange, right? It's not a decentralized exchange. Is that correct? Bet, yeah, Betdex itself, the application is, is a centralized, uh, uh, I would say it's a centralized interface and it's built on top of a decentralized exchange. That part, I don't understand. The decentralized exchange mechanism is that the actually matching happens with the, on the Solana blockchain. Is that the right way to think yeah, about so it? The, the, yeah, so the, the matching happens on the Solana uh, blockchain and it's a permissionless protocol. So anyone can go and choose to build upon it. So if someone else wanted to come and build a betting exchange which focuses on India or something like that, they can go and choose to go and do that. And we wouldn't call it control what they choose to build, uh, nor would we, uh, does, does that make sense so far? Ish. So this, like what I'm, the, the data structure I think about with an exchange is the order book. Like where does the yeah. order book sit? You have the, you have the list of bids, you have the list of offers. And when, you know, obviously when a bid, price is greater than or equal to the offer price as a transaction. That mechanism, that's on the Solana blockchain or that's yes. on your computers? It's on the Solana blockchain. So what Betdex is doing is it's surfacing that order book to you in our in, in this interface, right? Um, that you can access, but that's living on the blockchain. So, um, and I'm not, uh, I'm not that familiar with the mechanism of the blockchain. Uh, like, let's say there's 10 orders in for one market, does one blockchain unit hold all those 10 orders or are those 10 blockchain chains that are kind of tied together with pointers? Uh, so how it's all on, how sorry, is the order a, book collated basically? It's similar to like, it's, so it's a similar to like, it's first in first out matching methodology. Um, the, it's all on one blockchain each order sits in basically individual smart contracts, um, which all live on just one singular blockchain. And the matching algorithm, what it will do when there are multiple orders placed on either side of the chain, uh, or either side, you know, on, on the both of the bid and the ask, it will go through and match them based upon the best price possible, as well as taking into account of the time at which the orders came in. Okay, so, so sorry, I'm 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 drilling down to this, but I, I'm sure there's people in the audience who are super confused. So I get Solana. Yeah. Solana is something that's built on top of Ethereum. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. No, Solana this, is not built on top of Ethereum. It's 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 a, it's like a, it's an Ethereum competitor. Okay, it's Ethereum. Okay, so you have a thing called Solana. There's a Solana blockchain, which is the public the the distributed ledger for Solana, right? Yep. All right, and each. And I guess one of the features, since it's competing with Ethereum, is that it has this concept of smart contract, yes? Yes. I mean, so they both okay. have smart contracts. I mean, to put it very simply, Solana is a blockchain which is just very fast and very cheap compared, yeah. to, compared to Ethereum. Yeah. And what is a unit of thing on the blockchain called? What is a, what is a smart contract? Is it just a smart contract? A smart, yeah, so a smart contract is... It, it, it's just, it's a contract which is written in code, basically. And is that like an atomic unit on the blockchain? Does that make sense? Like, what is an entry in the ledger on Solana and Compass? Got it. Uh, so an entry, in, so the, an entry in the, in the ledger, think about it as if it's similar to like an entry that you would make into like an AWS database or something, but it's yes. public. Right? So everyone yeah, what is that called? 
Is that called a smart contract or does that have another name? I don't know what the exact name is for that. Like it's not called a smart contract. The smart contracts are things which live on top of the chain. Um, each unit in a, uh, on, on the blockchain is called a block. And each of these blocks contains like the transaction history of, all, of, of the activity which is occurring in that platform. Uh, but I don't know what that exact unit, like if there's a technical name for that. Okay, but I, I guess block, block sounds about right. So yeah. a smart contract is a collection of blocks. Is that the right way to think about that? Uh, no, a, a block can contain information from multiple, the block is just uh, a unit of, of information. As, yeah, it's information, right? And a smart contract is what provides uh, that information to be delivered onto onto the chain. So the way it would work from like a user perspective is let's say you and I place a wager and we get matched, that like history of that would be recorded on chain. That, right? that, okay. So let's say I'm the one, I'm the first one into the system. I place a buy order for X that goes into a smart contract that goes into a smart contract fits within a block on the Solana blockchain. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now let's say you want to pose an additional, you want to bet against me, but you don't match my price and there's an open order. So there's a buy order and a sell order in the system is yep. a second smart contract created or is a second. And then the one and two both live on the blockchain or does the second smart contract come along and say the first contract first smart contract is obsolete. I'm going to re-put everything into the second smart contract and bundle the buy order and sell order in the second smart contract. So it lives as two separate smart contracts, um, both on chain, and then they could potentially get matched, right? Depending upon the order flow, if that makes sense. Um, but they will live as two separate smart contracts on chain as unmatched orders. Okay. And so if there's a hundred unmatched orders, there will be a hundred smart, get, uh, smart gets, there will be a hundred smart contracts living on the blockchain. Correct. Okay. And then you said it's a permissionless protocol, which I think means that anybody can monkey with it. They, you don't need permission from Beddex, right? You don't need permission from Beddex to use the protocol itself. That's correct. And the protocol governs the smart contract, I guess, right? The, the protocol is, is what says this is how you adjudicate the smart contract. Uh, so the smart contract itself can't be like tampered with, right? Like it's, it, it's, it's, it's kind of lives out there, um, as, as code. I think the, uh, protocol, so the, the Monaco protocol is the on-chain matching algorithm and order book, which kind of lives out there. Like if there is a, I think, and I think where you're kind of going is there's what we're forming underneath that, which we can get into is called a DAO, which is this decentralized autonomous organization, which kind of governs a smart contract. Um, so if there are any changes, et cetera, that would occur to the smart contract, that would be per that DAO. But I do want to make it clear that we, as Betdex itself, we can't go in and like, call like, you know, arbitrarily modify the smart contract or match orders kind of, you know, uh, in a way which, uh, which, which the code wasn't originally written to do so. Okay. So what I'm, what I'm trying to understand is how the order book is constructed. Um, I guess, and eventually I want to get to like latency and things like that, but like, let's say, so you have an interface that sits on top of the Solana blockchain that you are, that you have put together, like, you know, it's a coincidence that you did the, did you do the Monaco protocol or did somebody else do that? We did. So we did the first version of it and now it's fully uh, open sourced. Uh, okay. So anyone can go and see it. Um, so, yeah. So the Monaco protocol, I mean, for the, for the, the technical understanding of what is going on, Monaco protocol lives on its own. Solana protocol lives on its own. And BetDAX is simply a client that sits on top of the Solana blockchain using the Monaco protocol. That's exactly right. Okay. So 
how do you maintain state in the sense of like, let's say you have a customer order that comes in through the broker bet decks. How do you know what the order book is at time T when some, when an order comes in? Are you like constantly reading the blockchain and ingesting it? Or do you, do you query the blockchain when an order comes in? How does that work? As BetDex, we're constantly reading the blockchain. And so if you go to our front end, you can see the kind of the live order book, right? Um, that is, that's being displayed at any given moment. The uh, protocol itself and the chain itself will store that data as orders come in from BetDex or other brokers. You mean one of the smart contracts will have pointers to the other smart contracts that have open orders in them? Is that the right way to think about it? Yes, because all of them are, because everything is sitting on the same protocol, right? Um, and so it's all like the same liquidity pool. So I, the, let's, so the order book that I'm displaying on, I as BetDex, I'm displaying to my customers. If you were to build your own product on top of Monaco and display that to your customers, the orders, the order book that you would be displaying would like, you'd be showing the same data. Yeah, I, I totally understand that. The part I don't understand is like, let's say whether it's BetDax or like a bet or whatever, let's say I want to build a company called a bet that does the same yeah. thing that BetDax does and compete with you guys. Like, and I want to display the order book. Do I have to go through the whole blockchain to reconstruct the order book? Or how do, how do I know, how do I qu query the blockchain so I know what the order book is of this market at this time? So it's, it's for all live markets, the order book is stored like in state and at any given moment on chain. Um, so you would be able to query the, uh, the protocol and be able to display that. The protocol itself, like we've created an SDK, et cetera, which, which you know, makes that process easier as well to be able to go and do that. So you query the protocol? Yes. How does that work? Um, Sorry, I'm well, getting it. The reason that I, I, I might be boring the, the crap out of some, some listeners here, but the reason I'm kind of going into it is because, uh, you know, we've been hearing for blockchain and crypto and all this kind of stuff for, for a long time. And like, I, I just do not understand the internal. So I find this incredibly interesting, even if it's a little bit dry for some people, I think it's super important to understanding um, the advantages and disadvantages of the uh, disadvantages of this. So, yeah, 100%. Go ahead. Go ahead. so, so how do you query a protocol? Like you, you're really querying the blockchain, aren't you? Cause the protocol. You are, yeah. You are querying the blockchain. Yes. Okay. So, and is it like a SQL query or like, like, how does it find what it's looking for? Does it have to go through each smart contract linearly and look at each one? So we've, we've created an API, which makes that process much easier. So it's actually kind of similar to in some ways of the Betfair API where you can go and query it. Um, right now you can use TypeScript to go and do that, but we're creating that in a few different, uh, trying to make that, uh, more digestible in other languages. Um, you could also query the chain directly, um, and there are tools that allow you to go out and do that, but most people would go out and use our, use the API, which we've released. And th this is a, a technical curi curiosity question. What algorithm does it use to query the chain? Like, does it go smart contract by smart contract? Does it do a binary search? Is there some index somewhere that remembers where all the smart contracts are? Like, how does it... Because I because I, I downloaded the blockchain the Bitcoin blockchain the other day and I think it's I'm gonna say the wrong number it was like 15 gigs or 20 gigs or something like how yeah. big is a Solana blockchain? I don't know exactly how how big it is, um, but the but the data to be clear that the data that we are showing is it's not the whole Solana blockchain data it's just the data that lives on the Monaco protocol right. Yeah, no, I, I totally understand that. But yeah. I'm saying like, let's say you spin up your instance for the first time. Do you have to query the whole blockchain to find out all these orders? Or is there some shortcut mechanism? Anyway, there, we can, we can... Right. There, 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 is a, there is a shortcut mechanism. So the API that we've built um, and the data that we're storing for Monaco, we're only storing the Monaco data. We're not storing the whole Solana blockchain data. Um, so when you're accessing it, you're, you're only pulling the data for for Monaco, if you use our, if you use the API. So 
and this is a little bit inside baseball in terms of market microstructure for exchanges, but when you have an order that comes in, I assume you have to wait for the confirmation to come back from the Solana protocol before you show that confirmed to the user. You do. Yeah. And, and how long does that take? Uh, so for the protocol, it's, so it's on the back end for the protocol to confirm it. That can happen in like less than a second. Um, the front end for the front end to display it, there's a lag with that. Um, and that's, that's related to, uh, the lag with how I'll call it the blockchain communicates data. Um, but the, for the order to be get confirmed in the back end, that can happen in less than a second. Um, okay. in some cases, microseconds. And what happens if two orders are received simultaneously? I mean, what happens to the order that comes after the first order? Uh, so it's first in, first out matching. Um, so the order which comes after the second order would live as an unmatched order on the order book. Okay. And the smart contract, like, does it go... I'm I'm sorry I'm asking these like super technical questions, but like no, go it, ahead, please. But basically, I'm saying like let's say somebody wants to buy fifty and two people want to sell fifty. Yeah. Okay. So like you have the standing order of somebody's buying fifty. Somebody sells fifty first. Let's say they're like a micro millisecond for faster. And yeah. then the second order comes in, and the first order comes in. The things match. That thing's not there. Um, how does the system handle saying? The, that thing you're trying to bet against, um, how does it update the order book to let the user know that they didn't get the order matched? So the order book is kind of like consistently updated, right? So like the, uh, there's these, I mean, I don't know how technical you want to get or how in depth you want to get into, but there's uh, well, these things called cranks and these cranks are basically a mechanism to tell the blockchain, hey, there is a uh, new entry into the ledger, if you will, run the crank or run the matching algorithm and run the matching algorithm, run the matching algorithm, right? And so every time that there's an order that comes in um, and it can happen, we're talking like, you know, it can be half a second, milliseconds, whatever it may be, the matching algorithm keeps running and the chain keeps getting updated with the, with the, uh, new state of things, right? And the state of things would be unmatched order comes in, unmatched order comes in, then they both get matched, and then they could, or, and then you know, the additional unmatched orders come in, etc. So think of the protocol, uh, think of the order book as something which is, I'll call it consistently updated. And what you are showing on chain, obviously taking into account a lag here, a lag here, which may be small, like latency lags, which may occur is showing the current state of what is happening on the, what well, the current state of the order book, uh, taking into account the matched and unmatched orders at any given moment. Got it. And <clears throat> let's, let's switch gears a little bit. So how, how many orders per second do you think the Solana blockchain can handle? So right now they're doing about, uh, 2,000 or probably 3,000 to 3,500 transactions per second. The whole blockchain. The whole blockchain, yeah. So, so is that, I assume that's zero sum, right? So, like if somebody else is on the blockchain is using 3,000, there's like 500 available per second. Is that, is that the right way to think about it? In ge generally speaking, uh, yes. Okay. So, like just to put numbers on it from this market's experience, and, and you know, I'm sure Betfair and BetDeck and, Matchbook have sort of similar profiles. We handle about a thousand orders per second across our exchange, 24 hours a day. Now it's probably closer to like two or 3000 on a Saturday. And it's probably like 200 at 2 AM on a Tuesday, something like that. So like you can already see like if markets were to move, like let's say we moved our business onto the Monaco protocol using Solana, um, I would assume that we would start hitting performance bottlenecks. Um, how do you envision handling future performance bottlenecks? Yeah, I mean, so I think one, that would be a great problem to have. Uh, we're not there. We're not there yet, right? In terms of the liquidity and the volume that we, that, uh, that we have on the exchange, given we just launched two months ago. Um, but two, the reason that we even chose to go and build on Solana is itself, like the tech itself 
the, the current state of the chain can handle up to about 50,000 transactions per second. It's just in terms of the hardware, et cetera, that's powering it. It's just in terms of the uh, uh, way that the, uh, the code, et cetera, has uh, uh, the current state of the Solana chain, what it's, be, what it's doing right now is called like 3,000 to 4,000, right? And so that is, has been consistently improving. Like a year ago, it was at like 2,000. Um, so we do think that the chain itself, you know, will like the chain and the tech and the people working on Solana will be able to scale that up quite significantly. Um, so, yeah. So what's the difference between that 50,000 number you just cited and the 3,000 number? 50,000 is more like right now, theoretical capacity, uh, 3,000 to like 3,500 is what's actually happening. Oh, I see. So you, so the theoretical limit is 50,000 and the current flow is 3,000. Correct. And that's, and the, yes, that's correct. Okay. So if those numbers are correct, you, you could do up to 47,000, assuming nobody else goes over their, over what they're doing right now, you could do 47,000 transactions per second. Correct. But the, uh, but I think there are software improvements that need to be made to the Solana, like code itself to also allow that, right? 50,000 is kind of like the theoretical limit that's imp that is uh, allowed by now by based on the hardware that's kind of ru that's running the chain. Right. And I'm not super familiar with with Solana, but I know as one of FTX's or SBF's prod uh, projects, like what is who owns the code base of Solana? Like, is there a foundation? Is there a group of people? How, who decides to how to make the Solana blockchain faster and who owns that decision? Uh, to be honest, it, 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 there isn't a single entity which owns it. Um, it is its own basically by the community. If you think about the major players, if you will, like who like have some influence over it. So Solana uh, itself was founded by uh, two individuals, Anatoly and Raj, uh, and they built a company called Solana Labs. And so they built the initial version of the chain. And then now there's a Solana Foundation, uh, which does help to uh, administer any improvements, et cetera, to the chain. Um, but in terms of like who's pushing the actual code and pushing the actual improvements to the chain, there are some people at Solana labs who are working on it. There's people at other companies, like one of the big ones is Jito Labs. That's one that's working on, that they've been pushing through a lot of improvements to the code. Um, there's also, uh, I think Jump Crypto um, is also pushing through a lot of improvements as well and adding additional functionality. So it is becoming, I'll call it like progressively decentralized. Um, so there isn't a single owner right now. Okay, pivoting to event management. How do you guys create events, manage events, halt? football matches, soccer matches, when there's a goal, like how do you handle that on the blockchain? Uh, so right now it's uh, the mark, uh, that's the responsibility of the market operator. Um, for now, so for us, the markets that we as Betdex run, the markets that you see on our interface, we are the ones who are creating those markets and we're the ones who are settling those markets. And so, uh, and we're doing that manually right now. Okay. And so you don't pay bet radar or somebody like that right now for the data. You just, you're just creating them by hand. Correct. Okay. And do, do you manage the markets? Like do you halt when there's a goal or do you just leave the market open? Uh, we're, we only have launched with pre-match only. So we haven't launched in play yet. Okay. And do you have plans to do in play or, or do you want to keep it pre-play for now? No, we, I mean, we definitely want to do it, do in play. Uh, we're planning on launching that later this year. Okay. And the, um, uh, you, you, you started off by saying that one of the key motivations for BetDAX is to support winners. So um, as I'm sure you're very familiar, betting is a zero sum game. So where do you plan to pay the winners from? Like, where do you think, what's your secret sauce? Like, I think it's one thing yeah. to say, um, yeah, let's have a platform that supports people to win and not be limited and all that kind of stuff. But in order for that to happen, you need people in equal measure to lose. So how do you Correct. see that side of the equation? Yeah. So I think that, I think, that, and that's even, the, that actually gets to the crux of the reason as to why we even chose to build on chain um, versus, you know, off chain, right? I think it's the potential for us to pool liquidity across various different applications, which all kind of talk to each other and, and work with each other. So it sounds a bit fluffy, but let me get a little bit deeper into that, right? So the protocol itself, given that it is a, 
kind of like a permissionless protocol and it's fully open source that allows anyone to go and build on top of it while accessing that same pool of call it shared liquidity. Right. And so we launched, uh, call it, uh, two months ago. And since then, so BetDex is one application that sits on this protocol. So we've been targeting international jurisdictions for our licensing and we're able to go and you know, get customers to come in from there. Now, if you look at, uh, if someone were to build another application on top of that protocol and maybe they have a specialty because they're targeting a different type of customer or a different jurisdiction, whatever it may be, they're able to go and access that same liquidity. The uh, end goal for us and the reason why I think we can eventually get to a place where we can limit uh, uh, or w- where we don't have to limit winners is because if you have an ecosystem where there's different code brokers who are specialized on user experience of different jurisdictions, et cetera, all sitting on top, all accessing the same, uh, or all bringing in users across like a shared liquidity pool. I think you can eventually create an ecosystem where there are called winners and losers, right? And uh, in that same liquidity pool. And so that's why we think that, uh, you know, we don't have to limit winners. Well, by definition, there needs to be one dollar for every for every winner. One dollar wins. You need one dollar to lose. Um, yes. But so basically, your answer is that if you have a diverse group of people who are plugged into the system from a de- diverse group of jurisdictions and motivations, that you will have enough synthetic liquidity for winners to trade against. Is that a good way to summarize it? That's the end goal and the end vision. Yes. Okay. And what do you guys? work with market makers? Do you incentivize market makers? Do you guys market make yourself? Yeah, so we're in, uh, we work, we're working to onboard institutional market makers right now. Okay, and what's the incentive? Like, how do you incentivize them to market make on a public protocol? Like, do you pay, you pay market makers or yeah. you pay them? Yeah, yeah. You okay, pay them. got it. And I think, and, especially, um, as I say, especially at the beginning, right, it's a completely new protocol. There's uh, and a new, it's, it's a new, new exchange. You just need to have liquidity to bring the, to bring people yeah. on. So, yeah, I think, I mean, from my experience, um, in the exchange space, it's really hard to get retail customers to put up liquidity. Yeah. So especially I think something as new and, and esoteric as, as an open order sitting on top of the blockchain. I think it's really hard to get, even if you had a diverse group of people to li- leave open orders into the system. Generally speaking, most retail customers just want to come in and bet and Correct. get their bets matched right away. Yep. So isn't that going to create a problem where if, you're, if your marketing message is to attract winners and the quote unquote losers or the retail flow that the winners can trade against don't want to leave open orders in the system, aren't you going to have a liquidity issue? Because the market makers, generally speaking, are winners as well. And you won't be able to have open orders for the winners to trade against. Potentially. Potentially. I mean, I think like potentially, yes. I think the, and that's why we're call it subsidizing them, especially at the beginning, right? To come in and, and trade is, be, and there are call it strict requirements around uh, the volume and, and, and that they're putting on and the, and the spread requirements and, and things of that nature. And we do, and the, the make the market makers we're bringing on, I think are, they realize that, most of the people that uh, will be trading against like against them or not putting up open orders are going to be takers, right? And that's why they're getting paid for it because they're kind of giving up the the benefit versus what call like, I don't know, like a syndicate or someone would, would do who's not getting subsidized in that manner, right? And if you were to compare, I, I guess, I know you just launched two months ago and, and congratulations, by the way, it's really hard to get something off the ground. So that, that's awesome to see innovation and new things in the industry. But if somebody were to ask you, like, how would you compare yourself to a Smarkets or to a Betfair? Like, what do you guys provide or what are you promising to provide that the existing fiat exchanges don't, don't do very well? Yeah. Um, so I... There's a lot of different things, but I really boil it down, boil it down to like three main factors, right? I think one, this is a platform where we're not going to get stake limited and where uh, if, if you are someone who's RI positive, you're not going to get taxed extra or anything at all like that. Um, two, it's a completely non-custodial platform. Um, and so what I mean by that is BetDex itself never actually touches or holds your money. Um, so when you place a wager, it's placed on a transparent, auditable 
publicly available smart contract. And what's the benefit to you as a user? Uh, once the match is settled uh, and settlement is triggered, that money comes back directly to your wallet, right? You don't need to go and try to get it out of the exchange. It's not difficult necessarily at a company like SmartKits, but if you're trying to get something out of Bovada or somewhere else, that becomes a pretty difficult proposition. Um, and third, our fees are quite low. Um, we're built, uh, right now they're non-existent, but when we do start charging fees, they will be low. We're able to do that because we're, our tech stack is frankly much lower cost than it is for a traditional book, given that we're built on chain on top of open source technology. Got it. So to, to push back on your first point, I would say I'm pretty sure Betfair doesn't, and we don't stake factor any customers. So what, so I, I get the non-custodial aspect of it. Um, I think that can be a double-edged sword. I think custodially, custodian, what's the right adjective? If we hold somebody's money, I think obviously the KYC stuff can get quite annoying and, and customers get frustrated with us. But, you know, if money gets stolen or things like that, um, customers have a, a measure of protection. Also, if uh, the blockchain is compromised, I guess their money could be compromised as well, whereas that's really not the case uh, in the sort of the fiat system. So I, I get that there's some benefits, but there's also some disadvantages, I would say, to the non-custodial stuff. In terms of the transaction fees, do you have a sense on what you would charge once you get rolling? Yeah, I I don't want to give the, give the exact number, but I think I call it somewhere between like one to 2% of net winnings is uh, probably is, is what we're okay. thinking. So we charge 2% of net winnings. So that so that's in, in the same ballpark. ballpark. Yeah. Okay, cool. So how do you, how would you compare yourself to like a, you know, a tier one sports book, like a Patty Power or a Bet365 or, or a FanDuel even? Like what, like what benefit do you guys offer that they don't? So, I mean, I think they're targeting a call it like from our exchange and the interface that we've built so far, they're just targeting a different type of uh, player, right? They're targeting someone who's more of a retail player who's more looking for, uh, like I'll call it bonusing and multipliers and things of that nature, where we're more so initially targeting the value better. So if you go to our uh, interface, which is more, it actually looks like, I think, a, pr a prettier version of Betfair, but probably with less features right now is what it looks like. And it has, it's, it, but it has like kind of like the full order book um, uh, with the market depth and volume and things of that and, and things like that. So I think the, the, in terms of like who we are, are going after, I think we're going after right now for the front end, a different, like a different customer base. Got it. Okay. And just for my own education, I think, I think it was TerraCoin collapse that was also meant to be a stable coin. Is that am, yes. I, am I saying the right name? So what I and I don't I don't understand the mechanisms of how a stable coin are put together. But just what's your response to like what's the stability of US UST? Is that what it's called? US. That was the Terra one. Yes, UST. What's the one that you use? US US DT. USDT. Yes. So if I'm a customer how do i have confidence that that's a real coin so uh so the stable coins think of them as kind of like two spectrums right one end of the spectrum you can have algorithmic stable coins the other end of this spectrum you can have stable coins which are backed by collateral and then you can have any things in the shade in the middle right which are half algorithm half collateral ust was one that was backed by uh, completely by an algorithm um USDT, what we're using is backed one to one by fiat currency, um, and so there's uh, so, so there's publicly attested like reports from auditors, etc., showing the collateral backing that coin. Which like uh, <laughs> which auditors? <laughs> I believe FTX had auditors as well. FTX did have auditors. Um, uh, I, I I can look. I, I I don't know off the top of my head. I'll, yeah. I'll look it up and I can tell you. So does a client hold its money non-custodially in USDT to trade with you? Do I have to, if I want to bet on your, on your platform do, on, with your protocol, I guess, do I have to have USDT to buy and sell? Yes, you do. Okay. So presumably if it collapses, I'm, I'm up Shit's Creek. Yes. Okay. So it's pretty important to under, like to have faith that USDT is. And is there a reason that you use you use that instead of 
any of the other coins like Bitcoin or anything else? Yeah, uh, I mean, two reasons. One, exactly to your point around having faith and making sure that it's stable, right? This is one of the few, I think, outside of this and USD, USDC is the only other one which are really fully backed one-to-one -one, uh, with publicly attested external reports um, from a collateral basis. Um, and two was just in terms of cryptocurrency like volatility. If you bet with like an Ethereum or a Solana or something, the price of that coin itself can given the volatility in the market can go can go quite significantly up and down um in uh during the during the course of a game right and so we wanted to make sure we had a stable currency to, to wager with one of your main benefits or purported main benefits is that you have an open ecosystem do you have examples of that being successful or or few proof points in that that that's a winning strategy yeah so we, we've had some early signs of success so we open sourced the protocol itself uh Two months ago and since then we've seen other builders outside of Bettex come and try to build different types of applications on top of uh, the protocol um, a few that i'll call out there is one which is called uh, dispet which is basically a uh, discord bot which allows you to place wagers directly onto the monaco protocol just from discord um, there's another one called tinbet which you know takes uh orders from the uh, it looks at the order book that lives on the protocol and then displays it in like a Tinder like interface for retail betters. So they can just swipe left or right on to and immediately like place a wager. Right. And so again, it's only been two months. It's still very early days. Um, but that's the type of like, uh, I'll call it like innovation and functionality that we're looking to really unlock. And it's great to see that. So. What, uh, how would you compare yourselves with direct competitors? I mean, I think there's like the Gnosis and Augers of the world. Like what, what are some of your direct competitors and what do you see as your differences between them? Yeah, so I think the biggest difference is I think is actually on the protocol side. Um, so for us, there's a lot of different competitors and a lot of people are like, just, all they're doing is building like prediction markets on, on chain, right? And so we're doing, we definitely have done that. But I think the biggest difference is around the fact that we call open source that protocol and allowed other people to come and build their own applications on top across a shared liquidity pool. And I think that that is really the key differentiator versus what the other uh, competitors are doing. The second differentiator, I would say, is we are focused on uh, purely focused on sports betting, right? Um, we understand the and the team itself that we built understands some of the nuances that uh, come about with sports betting, which may not be there in just a regular prediction market, right? So things like, you know, we know that we need to build cross matching into the uh, into the algorithm. We know that we need to uh, ensure that you know if we offer in play, retail is protected and things of that nature. So I think that we can really build a differentiated product experience for sports betting and uh, on chain. When you could look at the other call it. Uh, more uh, non-verticalized prediction markets that are out there. Got it. And that would include BetSwap, Aver, Dexport, those guys? Yeah, I, I, I think so as well, yeah. Especially as it relates you, to the protocol. Got it. Before we go, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do I want to be? Oh, man, that is a... I mean, I, I'm pretty happy with where I am right now, to be honest. But I will tell you the one thing that I've always wanted to do, which... I think might come out of call it left field for you. Um, but one of my favorite professors uh, in college uh, is, is a business school professor for undergrad uh, and actually actually went to Michigan State, which I hate to say. Um, but he uh, was someone who he had a lot of experience in uh, like a varied industries, like in, in private equity, consulting, et cetera. And he taught like one class at Michigan, which is this valuation class where he would come in and, uh, it, and it was only like one class, I think two sessions every semester. And I loved that class because uh, it was all very based on the real world. And like, he, like the textbook itself was like an amalgamation of different like articles and stuff, right? It wasn't a real textbook. And I, that like really resonated with me. And it's something that I would love to do in the future is actually go and once I gain a lot of experience in industry um, and you know, hopefully make a fair amount of uh, capital to live upon to just go and teach um, and, and teach in that manner. So, Oh, that's great. What's the, what's the professor's name? Uh, Josh, uh, I'll, get, I'll get his last name for you, but the class is 
when I was in school, it was evaluation. I forget, like it was evaluation class. It was like an elective yeah. in uh, Ross. So yeah. Great. So you want to uh, be an appraiser, I guess, when you're going. Uh, I don't. Well, I don't know if I, I'm not saying I'll, I'll teach evaluation class, but I want to be a teacher and a and or a some sort of like you know, a junk professor would be cool. Got it. Did you grow up in Michigan or did you grow up somewhere else? Uh, Philadelphia. Got it. I I used to live in Yardley, if you know where that is. I do very well. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks very much for joining the podcast, um, and thanks for putting up with my very uh, elementary questions about the blockchain and Solana and things like that. And I hope the, the listeners got a lot out of it because, I mean, there's there's no question like crypto is here to stay. It's, it's, it's I, I guess the big question is what direction is it going to take? But I think the more all of us understand crypto and its possibility, the, the more we can get um, leveled up in this in this space. And I think what you're doing is really cool and, and keeping that North Star of like, doing the right by the customer I think is great and I'd like to see more businesses in sports betting that are trying to uh, give sports bettors a fair shake so congratulations on your launch thanks for joining the podcast and I wish you the best yep thank you Jason